This was quite something. Just highlighted how important the Suez Canal is. I know you weren't terribly exposed to it, but uh, dry bulk carriers certainly were as well. Tell us a little bit about the cost and who bears it all. Yeah, well, you know, for, for a short-term closure of the Suez Canal, which I think it, th this is basically what we're referring to right now, and I think we're all very fortunate that this didn't become a longer-term incident. But as you said, uh, you've got 10 to 12 percent of total global trade that is going through the Suez uh, Canal. And shipping in general, which, which I think people are starting to realize more and more, is just a, an incredibly important uh, part of the global economy, accounting for 90 percent of, uh, of global trade. As you said, with dry bulk, you know that's sort of probably third in the in the pecking order. The container ship industry is the is the industry that uses the most um, uh, transits in the Suez Canal, Canal, followed by tankers, and then also dry bulk. But as you were alluding to, you know there are still 400 ships that are uh, that are tied up and waiting to go through the canal. Uh, so I do think we we've probably got a good week um, before that traffic gets cleared out and things get back to somewhat of a normal environment. I mean, John, it's not just as simple as this uh, ship just getting up and sailing into the sunset. It's going to be a bit more complicated than that. Tell us a little bit about the mechanics here of actually returning the canal to normalcy. Well, look, I mean, I, you're, they're effectively towing the, uh, the ship out. Um, like I said, I am, I am pleasantly surprised um, that this took such a short period of time to, to free the ship. I think there were um, there were quite a few people that thought that this was going to be a week, you know, weeks, three to four weeks of, of closure. Um, but we're still talking about a large number of ships that, that are anchored and, uh, and are not necessarily queued up. So coordinating the logistics of who gets to go through first and, and how that's going to be sorted out I think the uh, the Egyptians have quite a uh, quite a job on their hands, but so far I think um, all things considered, I, again I, I can't say it enough. I, I think this has gone relatively well, um, absent the uh, the blockage okay. itself. John, though, does it show that the world needs new shipping lanes? We know China has been looking at the likes of Thailand, Nicaragua. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, well, I think the the first thing that somebody needs to probably take a very good look at is. Just like they widen the Panama Canal, it probably makes sense to 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 look at widening the Suez Canal. Um, just from just from trying to avoid incidents such as this, but also because of the increased traffic and the increased shipping that is going on around the world, um, just because of the recovery in the global economy. What about uh, seafarers who are stuck and the thoughts and efforts to get them out, particularly given many have been stuck too during the pandemic and there's a lot of protocols trying to get in place to get people off ships that they've been stranded on for months? Yeah, th this, is, this is, was probably one of our biggest challenges in, in 2020 was repatriating our, our seafarers and getting them home to their families in a timely manner. Um, we were, uh, we actually did, Genco did one of the first full crew changes in Singapore um, in, uh, in early April uh, after COVID following a, a very set uh, stringent rule of, uh, of pr protocols. It's not just a matter of getting um, people off safely and getting them home safely and, and quarantined, but it's also bringing new crew members on and, and making sure that everyone is healthy as they get on board the ship. What about the thought that ships might be just getting too big as well, John? <laughs> well, you know, big, bigger, bigger is better. I, again, I, I think things adjust. If we look at what um, what they did in in Panama and widening the canal to uh, to to try to account for some of these larger ships, I mean, the container ships we've all seen the growth in that, but we're also seeing the growth in dry bulk. The the ships that carry iron ore. Um, have gone even in the last 10 years from being maybe 165, 170,000 deadweight ton all the way up to now 320,000 deadweight tons. So almost a doubling even in the even in the dry bulk because of the larger sizes of uh, of iron ore parcels. John, I mean, this is going to send uh, the cost of shipping really sky high, is it not? I mean, the thing is, we've got a lot of these ships delayed. They're on tight schedules, especially at the moment uh, with what's been happening last year. So give us a, a sense of how much you expect rates to be going up as a consequence. 
Well, the, uh, the again, the, the container ship industry, which is transporting semi-finished and, and finished goods and containers, I think that they will be the, the most affected. That, that market has become very tight from a supply and demand standpoint. Um, so I do see that that will eventually, uh, unfortunately, uh, affect the consumer. On the dry bulk side, um, and which, you know, just to give you a quick um, uh, synopsis, you know, Genco is shipping iron ore, coal, grain, and then a lot of minor bulk products such as cement and infrastructure type materials. And the dry bulk industry has is, is had a little bit of a rough time from a freight rate standpoint over the last few years. Um, with the with the dam disaster that unfortunately took place in Brazil in 2019, and then on the back of of COVID um, and and the global pandemic in 2020, and the, so the dry bulk industry is actually recovering from uh, from a recessionary period and is and is doing quite well because of the low supply or number of ships that are coming uh, coming out of the yards. So we're actually at an all time low in terms of the order book of dry bulk ships. Uh, versus the current fleet on the water. And then if we look at the growth in demand, we're seeing a lot of stimulus, a lot of growth, projected growth of 5% in world GDP this year. And, and that directly uh, benefits the dry bulk industry. The Again, the steel products such as iron John. ore. Yes, sorry. Yeah, I mean, this could actually potentially spark off inflation in the U.S. Uh, I'm just getting a sense. I mean, if you look at the Baltic Dry Index from this yeah. time last year, it's up 296 percent. Now, is it another case of people, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, you know, not having enough ships out there, you know, over ordering and then over scrapping? Yeah, I look at the overordering we always want to avoid. Um, the scrapping that's taken place over the last few years is, has slowly brought the industry back into balance. Um, again, you have to understand we're coming off of a very low period for, for dry bulk shipping rates. So looking at where the BDI is at, uh, at a little over 2000 today um, is actually healthy. Um, it's actually allowed to allowing ship owners to generate Good returns on capital again, um, and we are we are hopeful that we do not see an overbuilding situation uh, in in dry bulk ships um, in the uh, in the medium to mm. even near term. John, we've got the backlog cleared and now getting cleared, but I guess the main question is who's to blame here? Is it uh, the Suez <laughs> Canal operator? Is it the ship operator? Your thoughts? Wow, I, you know, I, I having been in shipping for over 25 years, I've uh, I, I've gotten to the point where I think you have to be very careful about deciding who's to blame or what actually happened um, until a full investigation is done. The, the one thing I will say is, you know, I the, there there are windy conditions in Suez, um, you know, quite a bit. So I, I do think there probably is something a little more to the story. But I'm very cautious about drawing conclusions until there's a full investigation done, which, of course, in this case, there will be.